Uh, but right now I am joined by Walter Hussey, who's been our legal analyst, uh, a defense attorney himself, and has been watching this case carefully. Uh, the jury came back six guilty verdicts. You've been talking about how difficult it would be to meet the burden of proof, especially on the toughest charge, conspiracy to commit murder. What is your reaction to six guilty counts? I'm kind of astounded, to be honest with you. I really didn't think it was going to happen on the major charge, the conspiracy to commit the murder. The other charges, maybe, but I just didn't see it happening in the big charge, so I'm, I'm really kind of blown away. Yeah, let's talk about what that means. She was convicted of conspiracy to commit murder. That means this jury felt that she not only knew about it, but she helped plan it. Pretty much, yeah, exactly. I didn't see it in the evidence. I really didn't. But, uh, but you did see it in, when the closing arguments, when they wrapped it up. And that, those closing arguments, let's talk about that, that final 30 minutes where McGinnis really had graphics and he talked about, he boiled it down to coincidence or conspiracy. How is she at all these places, at all these times, and doing all these things and not knowing anything? As she said in her recordings that she was, I guess, the dumb girlfriend, she said. Yeah, well... I agree with you to a certain degree, right? When I saw that, when I saw his response, Attorney McGinnis, I, I told you, I thought it was excellent. It's as good as I've ever seen um, by anyone. So he did a tremendous job. So obviously that carried the day. But I think what, I'm thinking about it logically, if you think that either she participated or she conspired to par participate in tampering with the evidence and hindering prosecution, which you might then say, you know what, she's charged with a conspiracy to commit the murder itself. Hmm. Where there's smoke, there's fire, literally, coming out that of the fireplace. That was one of the theme, the fireplace, where there's smoke, there's that, fire. That didn't help her. So maybe maybe they, they felt they could prove not only her participation after the fact, but a conspiracy, and then that kind of uh, imputed to the conspiracy to commit the murder itself. So let's just bring everyone up to date that it, with six guilty verdicts, we're talking about, uh, you, you went over this before, the, the most serious charge carries time of 20 years behind bars. That's right. And then uh, we have, uh, and here are the counts right there, we also conspiracy to commit tampering. That is a 10-year charge, I believe you said? I think the tampering is five, five. and the okay. hindering prosecution in the second degree is 10. 10, okay, I, I'm mixing those two up. But a cumulative of 50 years. Now she has, I, I'm asking you to do a little crystal ball here, but 50 years in general, we don't see people get 50 years when they've had no record. Is that correct? Or will some of these be combined? Or, or we just don't know? Not over but um, it's hard to say, okay? She has no criminal history, like you say. And what's going to happen from here is they're going to do a pre-sentence investigation. A probation officer is going to uh, interview Michelle. It's going to be basically her life, her biographic uh, sketch, right? Where she went to school, what type of family she has, and, uh, you know, if she has any issues, and people can support her. Conversely, the state can, uh, at the time of sentencing, bring in the victims, right? Which is obviously Michelle's family, Michelle's mom and Michelle's children. They would have an opportunity to be heard at that point, and, and that's going to be powerful. Yes. I mean, you would expect in the murder trials, we haven't gotten to hear a lot from the family, certainly not from the children, though we know we've been, uh, they've been showing up. Gloria Farber, Dulos, or, or Gloria Farber rather, was on the stand, and, but it was more, did, when's the last time you spoke to your daughter? Uh, did she ever not call you? It was very, mm. it was so compelling to watch her, but there wasn't a lot of in-depth questioning. It was more basic questions. In a sentencing, this is when she would talk about the loss and the impact of the murder of Jennifer Farber Dulos. Yeah, so how it works is um, there's also a victim's advocate uh, in the state of Connecticut. So that, that person represents in each, course, each courthouse the victims, right? So they, they can basically coordinate whatever is going to be said. Uh, these individuals can speak if they choose to. They have every right to at the sentencing. So. Um, Jennifer's mom could speak. Um, any one of the children could speak if they want to. I know it's going to be difficult. Um, there's other ways to do it. They can write an impact statement that can be read into the record. There's a lot of different things that go into it. And there's a lot of different reactions. I mean, I can tell you, I've done this a lot. I've seen people forgive the defendant, which is amazing. I've seen people say, I don't care what you give this guy, 100 years isn't enough. Mm. Uh, you know, so who's to say? Everybody's human. I don't know how they react to it. Right, right. Well, you know, as just to go back, there was so much inf information in this case about how Fotis Dulos murdered Jennifer Farber Dulos. And this was really an opportunity to get that evidence out there. Now, there's no conjecture of what happened to Jennifer, right? That's a big thing for the family. With this ruling, you can say she was murdered. Oh, yeah, no doubt about it. Yeah, they proved that. I mean, I think that was their mission, first and foremost. And I think getting her on that conspiracy to commit murder is gravy. I think the real mission was to prove that photo stools killed her, right? Mm. And, and
put put to bed the notion she disappeared once and for all. Yeah, and, and it, it's tragic. My heart breaks for Jennifer's family. Um, there are five children and now Michelle's daughter. So six children mm -hmm. impacted by this horrific crime that's captivated Connecticut and the nation. Um, if we go back to that bond, I actually thought it was interesting that the court suggested May 24th and then right away the lawyer said, we don't think that would be appropriate. Obviously, that would be the anniversary. Right. Uh, so now we're talking about a sentencing hearing on May 31st. In the scheme of $6 million, how does that fall? I know that the, the prosecution wanted to, to revoke the bond. No bond, right? Right. And, and, and actually, the defense argued that there isn't really precedent for that in Connecticut. I uh, think he's right. So you're entitled to bond, pretty much. Okay. okay. So $6 million in the scheme of bonds you've seen give our viewers an idea of where that is on the ladder. Well, it's funny you should mention it. So someone I know that's in the business had texted me <laughs> very much about this subject, and he's like, that, that's going to be a big policy. So in other words, typically whatever bond that's written by an insurance company, they're taking a risk, and that's exactly what it is. It's an insurance policy, and their compensation is a fee, and typically it's about 7%. So if you do the math, you know, that's 70,000 times 6, that's 420,000 would be the fee just to get her bonded out to the point where she's going to be sentenced. That's a lot of money. And that would, they would never recapture that, whoever put that up. Okay, so someone's got to, that's how much someone's going to have to come up with her, for her to go home. Yeah, it's like an insurance policy, so you pay for an insurance. So that would be the fee for her to come out. And, and you never get that money back. You never get it back, and the bond company's saying, look, we're going to take a risk by taking her out, but we're going to make sure she shows up to court for her sentencing. That's kind of how it works. And even if she shows up and does all that, that person who put the $420,000 never gets the money again. Never again. Okay, so we'll have to see what happens there. Um, I, we were just showing in court, um, we haven't seen much emotional reaction from Michelle Traconis. Uh, I, as journalists, we're just watching. But here she starts to put her head down. Her, her lawyers are rubbing her back. You actually thought one of the missions, perhaps, would be had they made her more human. We never heard from her. Is that unusual? Uh, no. Oftentimes, defendants don't. Don't, don't testify. But you did hear from her, you know, you know with the tapes. Yeah. During the course of the trial, who's to say? Everybody's different. She was stoic, for sure. Um, I mean, who am I to criticize? I, I, I really don't want to criticize the defense. That's right, not my right. place. But my point being is I, I think one of the problems that they kind of had, just from a visual, is she was so stoic. Um, a little more emotion, and, you know, a little bit of a feel for the jury. I don't think they really got that from her. And I could A be lot of people on, on social media, on my pages, were saying, you know, just that, that, that she wasn't showing any emotion. And that may be, you just, know, she's not American, and right. they may have different upbringing. But, but how much, you know, that, that kind of stuff, does the... In this case, we can only imagine, and we're going to hopefully get to hear from the jury, but as they polled them, and each one said guilty on every single charge, mm -hmm. uh, watching every, her uh, watching her in the courtroom, also some of the problems with her looking at her computer, all of that, all mm -hmm. of that plays into when they're also looking at the evidence. But ultimately, it was all that evidence that they had to go through. Yeah, I mean, so she's crushed right now. Let, let's let's say she really is innocent. Even though she's found guilty, that could be a possibility, and she's reacting to that. She could be reacting to, oh, my God, I'm going to jail for God knows how long. It could be she, That reaction is real, but it, for whatever reason, she's reacting to the situation. It proves, she, you know, she actually is human. She was stoic during the case. And I think what you raised the point when the family, when, when Jennifer's mom testified, she really didn't have a lot to add, but she had a physical presence. You could actually see. You could see the resemblance. Exactly. And so she brought Jennifer into that court courtroom which mm -hmm. resonated with the jury I mean that's powerful that's powerful and coming from a defense attorney I know that I'm just wondering how this all gets presented and we do expect uh, I would expect John Schoenhorn has spoken to the public before we are monitoring that as they come out uh, but in 